and welcome to one of those episodes of the Oddity Archive that's far more painful for me to make than it is for you to watch. And those are the least fun ones for me to make. I guess I'm a bit sadistic, aren't I? Uh, anyway, uh, for whatever strange reason, people seem to like it when I cover bad sitcoms. Uh, to put this in perspective, the last time I did this, and I'm not exaggerating, it did around 15 times the business that my videos usually do. So, uh, who am I to question it? But, uh, yeah, I am just kind of treating that one as a fluke right now. But anyway, it, it was that last round of sitcoms that inspired this one. So if you saw that episode, one of the sitcoms I covered was the TV adaptation of the film Harry and the Hendersons. And it just led me down this great big rabbit hole of sitcoms that were adapted from movies. And admittedly, the pieces just kind of fell into place for this one. So with that, I've got another three sitcoms to cover here. It seems to be a good number. And this time I've got one from the 70s for you, one from the 80s, and one from the 90s. Albeit presented in no particular order, because that's just how I roll, baby. And before you ask, no, M.A.S.H. is not one of them, or even after M.A.S.H. for that matter. I'm not that bad. Anyway, uh, let's burn off some more of our precious brain cells, shall we? <music> Admittedly, I'm cheating slightly with this one. Of course, The Odd Couple was a play, then a movie, and had already been a sitcom once and a short-lived cartoon. Anyway, in case you've been living under a rock, The Odd Couple's basic premise was two divorced men with opposite personalities trying to share an apartment without killing each other. In 1982, an attempt to revive the TV series was made, and it was kinda doomed from the start. The only even semi-significant change from the 1970-75 TV series was that the two leads were now black. <laughs> Perhaps you don't see the humor at this particular point in time. On paper, the ever-creatively titled New Odd Couple seems like it could work. The premise was certainly general enough that the field for episode plots was fairly open. Thing is, at the time, a Writers Guild strike was going on. As such, out of necessity, 8 out of the 19 episodes were barely revised scripts from the 1970-75 to 75 series, only the cultural references were updated. Even though we're dealing with the two same characters, Felix Unger and Oscar Madison, the dialogue was clearly written with Jack Klugman and Tony Randall's delivery in mind. Oh, I think that's all behind us. Felix, you hate it! There's going to be huge clouds of cigar smoke, non-stop beer drinking, lots of spilling and burping. <laughs> That's okay, Oscar. We were at your wedding. As for the two leads, Ron Glass took on the role of prissy, fussy Felix Unger. And it made sense. Glass had played the somewhat similar Sergeant Harris on Barney Miller, which incidentally had just ended its run a few months earlier. The main difference in character being that Sergeant Harris was far less neurotic than Felix Unger. As such, I can't help but wonder if Glass didn't feel a bit typecast. I really did feel like I was watching just an amped up version of Sergeant Harris. As for the Oscar Madison character, former Sanford and Son co-lead DeMond Wilson took on the role and I got the feeling he was ready to break out of, once and for all, playing eternal straight man to Red Fox. Wilson, physically and performance-wise, is light years away from Lamont Sanford, throwing himself into the slovenly Oscar Madison character. Having said that, he may have overdone it. At times, I felt like he was trying to ape Jack Klugman or even Walter Matthau instead of putting his own stamp on the Oscar character. 
Even when she said she wanted more independence, I did everything I could to help her get it. But it's okay. <laughs> I can handle it. Congratulations, Felix. I knew that you'd work it out in your own unique and mysterious way. As mentioned, around half the series wound up being recycled early 70s scripts. Of the five episodes currently circulating online, only two appear to be then newly written, and those wind up feeling more like an off-brand odd couple pastiche as opposed to the further adventures of the real Felix and Oscar. And it's a real shame. I, I absolutely loved the two leads in their most famous roles. Hell, Barney Miller is one of a precious few sitcoms I've ever cared enough about to acquire the complete series on DVD. DeMond Wilson was always great on Sanford and Son, especially when playing off of Red Fox. But like most of the shows I've covered doing these episodes, it couldn't rise above the weak, and in this case recycled, writing. The New Odd Couple finished its only season in 60th place out of 100 in the Nielsen ratings, which wasn't enough in ABC's eyes for a renewal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Oscar Madison. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Stand by this. Mr. Oscar Madison. Amusingly enough, since The New Odd Couple, the show has been revived once more in 2015. This one lasted three seasons, and I'd never heard of it prior to making this episode. Anyway, I think I can safely say that The Odd Couple has won multiple showbiz recycling bingo games by now. Yeah, I know you're so good. Good. Yeah. Good night. This. Best to do. Let's go down to the Delta House. Let's go down to the Delta House. I admit, I haven't seen National Lampoon's Animal House in many years now, but I remember A, liking it, and more importantly, B, that it had a very satisfying ending. If only for the latter reason, I'd say Delta House had its work cut out for it. Once you add in losing all of your major characters and actors thereof from the movie, you're left with little more than a thankless task. It really, even if the writing was really good and the cast was great, getting audiences to warm up to it is going to be near impossible. And that's more or less what happened with Delta House. The crazy wild and the rough and rude. Debuting in January of 1979 on ABC, only about six months after the Animal House movie premiered, Delta House attempts to pick up where the movie left off. We're still at Faber College, it's still the fall of 1962. Dean Wormer is still antagonizing the occupants of the Delta fraternity, and shenanigans ensue. Most of the same Delta fraternity characters are back, just played by different actors. Only the D-Day character is the same actor. Having said that, the dominant personality of the film, Bluto Blutarski, uh, John Belushi's character in the movie, is written out completely, having been expelled in the movie and since drafted into the army, and nothing more. To fill in for Belushi, we're given Bluto's ultra-shy brother, Blotto Blutarski, who promptly sinks to the bottom of the fraternity. To make matters worse, none of the characters are given enough of a personality to stand out. As such, none of the actors stand out. Weirdly enough, only a young Michelle Pfeiffer kind of stands out, who only appears occasionally and only gets a few lines here and there, and she only gets by because she's Michelle Pfeiffer. Who needs windows? There's nothing to see outside. Or floors. Floors? <laughs> Why bother? The floors work fine. <laughs> or stoves, or the laundry. Maybe it's just because I'm an old civil defense broadcasting nerd, 
but only the Guns of October episode made much of an impact on me. Thanks to some failing PA equipment, the year's Operation Alert mock nuclear attack exercise is mistaken for the real thing, leading to some interesting and probably unintentional on the part of the writers, looks at human nature in the face of such events, and gets off some solid satire in the process. Otherwise, I found Delta House to be an adequate sitcom. There's some decent enough jokes here and there, but it never really gets off the ground. Having said that, the going theory for Delta House's failure is that it had to be watered too far down from the R-rated movie to make for a decent network sitcom. I personally think that the Animal House movie simply didn't leave enough room for the occupants of the Delta fraternity to carry on. And it's kind of a shame, because at varying times we do have Harold Ramis, Doug Kenny, and a young John Hughes on the writing staff, the first two having written the film. At my most charitable, I'd say everyone did their best, but there was just too much to overcome. The series unsurprisingly folded after a single 13-episode run. Incidentally, all but one episode of this series is available for viewing on YouTube as of my making this. To end on an amusing side note, at the same time that Delta House aired, there were two other short-lived campus-based sitcoms going on. Brothers and Sisters on NBC, and Coed Fever on CBS. Brothers and Sisters, of which as of my making this, three out of the twelve episodes are on YouTube, feels like a weak knockoff of, strangely enough, Delta House. As for Coed Fever, I could only find the first two minutes of the one and only aired episode. It makes Delta House look like MASH by comparison. I wrecked the car. There are men on campus. They started this fall. But don't worry, Dad. They're across the hall. I'm giving trigonometry the old college try. I study every night for this real cute guy. Holy fuck out of me. Well, well, Mr. Sneeze. Put him up, dirtbag! Surprise, Mahoney! The old gun in the tie trick. Now back off. Okay! My crazy cruiser! What a lucky break! Zed, look out! Yeah. Zed, yeah, please, he's dangerous! Dangerous? Ew! Wow! So now! Go to sleep! Welcome to jail. I love this job. Please comes clean and justice triumphs again! Case closed! Police Academy, each other separately. I feel a draft! We're here. Those crazy cadets from Police Academy are busting out. Uh, Benny Boy, the Police Academy TV series was a Saturday morning cartoon, not a sitcom. Well, actually, there was a second stab at a Police Academy TV series in 1997. Now, I freely admit that I loved the Police Academy movies as a kid, though in retrospect I might have been a little too young for the first two when I first saw them. I also freely admit that I haven't watched a Police Academy movie in many years now, and I only own one of them today, and it's on Laserdisc. And I freely admit I haven't watched it out of fear that my nostalgia bubble might get burst. Having said that, I was blissfully unaware of the Police Academy sitcom, and it aired at the same time that I was deepest into the movies. That bodes well. What I see before me makes me wanna puke. <laughs> Who's talking? This version of the Police Academy series debuted in syndication in September of 1997, though judging from YouTube postings, it apparently ran on TBS at some point as well. Only one character remains from the movies, on a semi-regular basis at least. Michael Winslow, as the ultra-vocal talented Sergeant Larvell Jones. Unfortunately, his character has stayed pretty flat since the movies. 
Anyway, everyone else is a direct analog of a previous character. For example, lead character Richard Casey, played by Matt Berlanghi, is just a new version of Carrie Mahoney, Steve Gutenberg, from the first four movies. Some characters are supposed to be the offspring of their film counterparts, like uh, <laughs> twins, Dean and Dirk Tackleberry, nephews of David Graff's Eugene Tackleberry character. Leave it to these guys to heat it up again. May I kiss you again? No, you may not. Police Academy, mission to Moscow. To me, the chief issue with this series is that the movie franchise had long run out of steam. There were seven movies. So uh, trying to revive it as a regular TV series just seems downright foolish. To add insult to injury, Police Academy the series was given a one hour time slot. So everything winds up feeling like yet another sequel, just now with new cadets. I would say maybe it could have flown as a standard half-hour sitcom, but I fear it would have wound up being just that much more repetitive. To make things even worse, the slapstick comedy, which was the bread and butter of the movies, is incredibly muted here. It seems like most of the actors simply didn't wish to partake in the silliness, so it all goes to the same few characters willing to do such things, with increasingly predictable results. To make things still worse, some good actors go to waste. SCTV alum Joe Flaherty is the new would-be Commandant Lassard, Commandant Heffelfinger, but his character often comes off as if his Guy Caballero character from SCTV had sustained brain damage at some point. And that hurts coming from an SCTV lover like myself to make a statement like that. Still worse, some actors from the movies do make one-off appearances, but they're given little to do. Worse yet, they don't always play their old characters. Learn. What did I tell you guys? Beautiful it shouldn't come as any shock that this edition of Police Academy didn't make it past the first season and the makers clearly knew a second season wasn't going to happen. The final episode is effectively them blowing what was left of the budget by taking everyone on a ski vacation and, rather weakly, tying up the loose ends of the season. I won't ruin it for anyone who hasn't watched. Indeed, the entire series, as of my making this, is available for streaming on Tubi for free. Having said that, be prepared for the series to be in widescreen, as in the top and bottom of the image have been lopped off. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I dryly expound on the cultural significance of Barney the Dinosaur which I expect to be just me compulsively singing the theme song. Largely because I think that's where my skill level is going to be at by then. I think I can feel those sitcoms kicking in. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm fine. How are you? School's okay. There's not much new. My check this month didn't go too far. I lost my books. The old college try. I stush every night with this real cute guy. We met in the laundromat by the machines. We lost track of time and shrunk our jeans. Things are better than they were last year. Maybe it's because the men are here. There's more activity and more. Let's just hope that the CIA and the KGB can work things out with the OAS. Because if they don't, it's R.I.P.